Happy Holy Day, everyone. Well, Leviticus 23 covers the holy days throughout the year. We know the holy days map out God's overall plan of salvation. You remember Passover in the days of love and bread, picturing the sacrifice of the Lamb of God and how our guilt and sins can be put away upon repentance and accepting that sacrifice. And also learning about our role in keeping sin out. And then Pentecost pictured the reality that we can be first fruits in this current age. Those of us who have the indwelling of the Spirit and are called to be in the church. So now, on today, the Feast of Trumpets. It's rich in meaning, heavily intertwined with the motif and symbolism throughout the Bible of trumpets. The ancient Israelite would have associated a trumpet with the shofar. We heard that just a few minutes before 11 o'clock. That shofar was typically made of a ram's horn. And the culminating event associated with trumpets in the Bible is the return of Jesus Christ. Matthew 24 says that the return of Christ coincides with the great sound of a trumpet. Revelation 11.15 says that this is the last of seven trumpet blasts just discussed in the prophetic time sequence in Revelation corresponding to the return of Christ. So we know the return of Christ is good news for the earth. Maybe I should say great news. It will become a time of transformation of this earth and society in the way that it's supposed to be, the way that God intended. And we can be involved in that as a member of God's eternal spiritual family if we are that wise and faithful servant. But prior to that, the earth will be in great upheaval. Matthew 24, 22, talking about the time of tribulation at the end, says, unless those days were shortened, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So when you do a Bible study on trumpets, you see that trumpet blasts signify different things. Perhaps a call to assembly, perhaps a call to battle, something announcing God's intervention, the heralding of the coronation of a king, and in addition, the purpose of warning. The trumpet can be symbolic of prophetic warning. Today, this message is titled, Trumpets of warning. Let's look at a couple examples in Isaiah 58, verse 1, where a trumpet is associated with warning. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1. I invite you to turn to that scripture. As per my normal custom, I repeat scriptures three times and give you time to turn. Isaiah 58, 1 says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. So it says to lift up your voice like a trumpet. And following this prophetic principle and example, we do so in the Beyond a Day magazine and in our television program and other media efforts. Of course, this is only one facet of the message we need to preach. In scripture, it's clear that God's revelation is expansive in scope, so it's not just a I told you so message. We want to also instruct people about the way out of those sins and the way to have a right relationship with God and man. Let's turn to Jeremiah 6, 16 to 17. Jeremiah 6. 16 to 17. And Jeremiah 6, 16 says, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. Verse 17, Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Listen to the sound of the trumpet. 
But they said, we will not listen. So watchmen sounded that shofar, symbolic of a warning and a message, but there are some who refuse to hear, or maybe were too busy to hear. So in this message, I want to focus on two points about the trumpets of warning. Number one, the warning to modern day Israel, and number two, the warning to God's people, in other words, the church. These are not my warnings, I hope to convey the warnings that have been recorded for us in the Bible. So let's start off with the trumpet warning to Israel. From one blood, God made every nation of men, but he did choose a nation to work with for his purpose. It wasn't a matter of choosing a favorite, but choosing a nation who would be an example and fulfill his purpose. In Genesis 12, 1, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, and at that time Abram was in Mesopotamia, eastern side of the Fertile Crescent, from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. So the nation that God chose was from the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you remember Jacob had 12 sons, and thus came the 12 tribes of Israel. And so often in the Bible, a reference to Jacob is to his descendants, the people of Israel. Today, the world, for the most part, recognizes the Jewish people, principally derived from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. However, most of the world believes that the other tribes have been lost to history, sometimes referred to as the Ten Lost Tribes. My purpose today isn't to, to go in detail regarding the identity of the Lost Ten Tribes in our modern world, but you know we have a booklet, The United States and Britain in Bible Prophecy, where we can get the full story. The Bible and history reveals that the Ten Northern Tribes of Israel were taken into captivity and eventually migrated and more than 2,000 years later came into the place of some of the modern democratic nations of Northwestern Europe, Britain, and the United States. In Genesis 48, Jacob places a particular blessing on the sons of Joseph, a blessing of prosperity and prominence, and that was on Ephraim and Manasseh. Our booklet explains that Ephraim and Manasseh in the modern age has been respectively Great Britain and some of its commonwealth of nations and the United States of America. Let's turn to Jeremiah 30, verse 4. Jeremiah 30, verse 4. And in Jeremiah 30, verse 4, it says, Now these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. For thus says the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling. So the prophet Jeremiah was sent to the house of Judah in his day. This would have been uh, the 6th century B.C. But Jeremiah also prophesied to the house of Israel which God had sent into captivity before Jeremiah was even born. So Jeremiah wrote of a time of national trouble that is still yet to be fulfilled for the modern descendants of Israel. Let's read verses 5 through 8. For thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. Why do we see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor, and all faces turn pale? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them. So we have a time of trouble prophesied for Jacob, but eventually he is saved out of it. And verse 8 even indicates that 
This time of trouble involves enslavement. How do we know that this time of Jacob's trouble is yet future? Well, we can read in verse 9. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. So this verse 9 is after Christ returns to establish the kingdom of God on earth. It's yet future. Let's turn a few pages back to Jeremiah 16. Jeremiah 16, and we will read verses 14 to 15. Jeremiah 16, verse 14 says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them, for I will bring them back into their land, which I gave to their fathers. So the bringing out of Israel from captivity in Egypt was long ago history at the time Jeremiah wrote this, and he prophesies about another deliverance of Israel for, from far-flung places. Some people think this was fulfilled with the establishment of the Jewish state of Israel by the UN resolution in 1947-48. But when you look at the Bible and see the millennial-like conditions that are to be restored when Israel is brought back from captivity, we can see that the establishment of Israel in 1948 was not a fulfillment of this prophecy. So what brings on end time trouble for Jacob? Let's turn to Deuteronomy 28. In his sermonette on the Sabbath, Mr. Gardenhier gave us all homework. He said, read Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28, it's divided into two parts. The headings in your Bible are not inspired, but most Bibles will say, blessings on obedience or something like that starting uh, just before verse 1 and then right before verse 15 it says curses on disobedience. Now in general there are blessings for obeying God and his law and his instruction and the opposite for disobeying and we can turn throughout the Bible for demonstration of that general principle. But Deuteronomy 28 was also addressed to a specific nation. And now I will read from a portion of our booklet on the U.S. and Britain in prophecy. Quote, if the Israelites would fulfill their part of the covenant agreement with God, God said he would make Israel the premier nation of the world. But if the Israelites disobeyed, they would suffer the consequences. God told them other nations would take them captive. Even their punishment was to be a lesson to other nations. And here they quote verse 37, you shall be an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations where the Lord will drive you. So the Israelites were supposed to be a model to other nations in obeying God and reaping blessings. Of course, there were penalties for disobedience to God's instruction. So regardless of the choices they have made, both anciently and today, this is still the role that God has given them. And he holds them responsible for the way they respond to that role. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 7, please. Ezekiel chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 1. And Ezekiel was also sent to the house of Judah. In fact, during the time of their exile in Babylon. In fact, he starts prophesying when he is a captive in Babylon. Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, son of man, that says the Lord 
Thus says the Lord to the Lord God to the land of Israel. An end, the end has come upon the four corners of the land. Verse 3, now the end has come upon you, and I will send my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways. I will repay you for all your abominations. My eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity, but I will repay your ways, and your abominations will be in your midst. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Skipping to verse 14 and 15. They have blown the trumpet and made everyone ready, but no one goes to battle, for my wrath is on all their multitude. The sword is outside, and the pestilence and the famine within. Whoever is in the field will die by the sword, and whoever is in the city, famine and pestilence will devour him. So again, I said that Ezekiel was taken into Babylonian captivity when the kingdom of Judah was. This was 130 years after the Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom of Israel. So Ezekiel's mission and message was not primarily aimed at the ancient kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, because they were already in captivity. No doubt Ezekiel directed some of his message toward the kingdom of Judah which at that time was going into or in captivity. But parts of his message were to the whole house of Israel, all 12 tribes, and are applicable to the time of the end. I think I have time to go to Ezekiel 39, verse 25. Ezekiel 39, 25. To see, to see an example of a mention of the whole house of Israel. Ezekiel 39, verse 25. And Ezekiel 39, 25 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. Now I want you to turn to Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22. And we'll start at verse 6 and go to verse 16. Ezekiel 22, verse 6. And it says, Look, the prince of his, princes of Israel, each one has used his power to shed blood in you. In you they have made light of father and mother, in your midst they have oppressed the stranger. In you they have mistreated the fatherless and the widow. Verse 8, you have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbaths. In you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. In you are those who eat on the mountains, referring to pagan rituals on mountaintops, high places. In your midst they commit lewdness. In you men uncover their father's nakedness. In you they violate women who are set apart during their impurity. Verse 11, one commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. And another in, you, another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. In you they take bribes to shed blood. They take usury and increase. You have made profit from your neighbors by extortion and have forgotten me, says the Lord God. Verse 13, Behold, therefore, I beat my fists at the dishonest profit which you have made, and at the bloodshed which has been in your midst. Can your heart endure, or can your hands remain strong in the days when I shall deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. I will scatter you among the nations, disperse you throughout the countries, remove your blindness completely from you, or your filthiness completely from you, you shall defile yourself in the sight of the nations, then you shall know that I am the Lord. So we have a long list of various national sins of all kinds. Not worshiping God properly, oppressing the weak, violence, immorality, stealing. These aren't the gray areas. These are clear, obvious violation of God's law and his intent. 
Now let me go back to Jeremiah, and we'll look at Jeremiah 30, verse 3. Jeremiah 30, verse 3. And in Jeremiah 30, verse 3, it says, For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land I gave their fathers. They shall possess it. So there is good news for Israel and Judah. They are going to come back from captivity, and this is yet to be fulfilled. Let me turn to Isaiah for another glimpse at an end-time prophecy, and this is Isaiah chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 11 to 12. And Isaiah 11 says, Verse 11, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations. He will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Again, an end time prophecy. Let me add more to the picture and the story with Zephaniah 3. Zephaniah 3, which will give a glimpse on what these circumstances and conditions will work out within the people. Zephaniah chapter 3, 11 to 15. And Zephaniah 3, verse 11 says, In that day you shall not be shamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. For then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride. And you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. Verse 13, the remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths, for they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Verse 14, sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of kings, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. So those that remain in Israel after all this trial and calamity and testing are a humble people. They're a repentant people, humbled by the events and circumstances that they went through. Let's go to Zechariah. Uh, Haggai follows Zephaniah, and then there's Zechariah, and we'll go to Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13, 8 to 9. Zechariah 13, verse 8 says, And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, I will answer them, I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. So frankly, thinking about these percentages and these numbers is not pleasant. But in the end, God will have refined and tested. And those that come out will be such that God says, this is my people. 
and the people will clearly acknowledge God in their thinking and in their way of living. Let's turn to Ezekiel 33.11 to capture a very important point about God's character among all these circumstances. Ezekiel 33.11. We're trying to capture the whole picture here, and Ezekiel 33.11 says something very important. Ezekiel 33.11 says, Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? So remember that God takes no pleasure in this. In fact, let's go to Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4. God said this to that first generation that, actually the second generation that left enslavement in Egypt. Deuteronomy chapter 4. 28 to 31. Deuteronomy 4, 28. And Deuteronomy 4.28 says, And there you will serve gods and the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in distress, and all these things come upon you in the latter days, when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swore to them. So an important underline on that God is merciful, and he will not forget. Now let me ask you to turn to Jeremiah 23. Yes, a lot of scriptures to turn to today, but we're trying to... Capture the complete story. Jeremiah 23, 5 to 6. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6. And verse 5 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name, which he will be called, the Lord, our righteousness. So obviously not fulfilled at Christ's first coming. This is fulfilled at Christ's second coming. One of the principal fulfillments of the Day of Trumpets. So the prophesied calamity on Israel for its disobedience and not fulfilling God's purpose is not necessarily the way it has to be. The prophecies of calamity are conditional prophecies. In essence, the prophecies have an if clause. If they forget me, if they become idolaters, if they forsake my holy things, if they do evil to one another. Perhaps it's unlikely that the nation, I'm even referring to our nation today, can turn around. But in the meantime, we preach a message that hopefully as many as possible will heed and result in changes in their lives so that they can be counted worthy to escape. And we would want to pray that this nation does not have to go through all this calamity by repenting. We understand we're all spiritual pilgrims in this world but we have a pilgrim home, at least for me and almost all of you, the United States of America. I count my blessings that my parents decided to come to the United States 60 years ago. So we want to pray for our nation and our leaders. 
As for the follower of God, in the midst of all this calamity, there is protection. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And we'll read verses 13 to 17. Revelation 12, 13 to 17. Verse 13 says, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who, was, who gave birth to the male child. But the woman, and the woman is symbolic of the church, was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to a place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth and a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So now I want to bring up the second point about trumpets of warning, and that would be the warning to the church. Let's turn to Luke 21, 36 for what Christ said to his disciples then and to all of us throughout time. Luke 21, verse 36, as we cover the topic of trumpets of warning to the church. Luke 21, 36, familiar to most ears, says, Watch therefore, and that watch primarily means watch your spiritual condition. Yes, it does mean Watch around you so that you know what's going on. But watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And you say to escape what? Well, let's look at verse 34 and 35. But take heed to yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come upon, come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Matthew 24, 42 says, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5. I think Mr. Young was here, but let me see if I cover some different verses. 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, and we'll read verses 1 to 2 to start. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1 says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, and then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. Verse 6, therefore let us not sleep, as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, those who get drunk are drunk at night, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and us a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint to us wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So God warns us, the church, so that we can obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. That's what, what, that's what verse 9 says. God does, not warn, God does not warn because he likes to make threats, because he likes to make people squirm. He doesn't make threats because he has disdain for mankind. No, God is warning out of love. The God we worship has a purpose. He has a loving purpose for mankind, and he does love us. Remember, for God so loved the world. 
But he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We always need to under, understand that principle in understanding God's plan. So God warns out of love, and if the more gentle warning is not heeded, then perhaps tougher love may, need, may be needed. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And we'll look at verses 3 through 11. Hebrews 12, verse 3. Your uninspired heading may say the discipline of God. Verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and, every, and scourges every son whom he receives. Verse 7, and if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? And verse 10, for they indeed... For a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. And throughout this passage, I'm reading from the New King James where it says chastening. You can also put in the words discipline and training. And all this discipline and training is out of love. How God's discipline is exactly worked out? We don't always know. Was something negative that happened to us, the normal consequences of carelessness and or disobedience? Or was it time and chance that God allowed to happen to us? Or did God actually bring about a trial for our good? We do not always know. But every trial can bring, a, bring about opportunity to learn about ourselves and to grow and to become more like Christ. Let's go to 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8. Second Timothy 4, 6 to 8. And 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, and finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to those who have loved his appearing. What a nice phrase, those who love his appearing. We want to be among those who love his appearing, whether his appearing to us is when we are raised immortal from the grave or if we happen to be alive when Christ returns. Some on earth will not love his appearing. They want to do their own thing. They want to live their own way. We read in Revelations, some would rather have rocks fall on them than to be under God. Some will not want or will not love his appearing because they're not ready. In light of the first message, they haven't properly prepared. They perhaps thought at some point in the future they would start getting ready. And then there may be some who 
do not love is appearing because things for them are going so well for them on this earth that the return of Christ doesn't seem like an improvement for them. And some followers of God who are doing the right things can sometimes be in this category. It reminds me of a country song that has the lyrics, I've had an excellent time so far. All that I fear, or there's one, there's one thing that I fear, it could all be downhill from here. So we see the problem in this case. Even when things are going great, that attitude is a focus on self. And we have to remember that Christ is coming for the benefit of all mankind. The kingdom of God is needed by all mankind. And we don't want to lack the vision of how great the kingdom will be compared to the best of earthly life when things are going right. So we want to be ready for his coming. Like I said, whether we go to the grave first or remain alive. God expects us to be so doing as that wise and faithful servant at his return. So we need to be continually growing, serving, and gaining spiritually. You remember the parable of the talents. God wants to see profit, of course, that spiritual profit, that spiritual gain. A wise person once said, be ready as if Christ comes tomorrow, but continue preparing and planning as if there were 100 years to go. Let me also make a final comment about something called warning fatigue. I spoke to some of our members about this on the Sabbath because there was a very practical example recently involving two of the hurricanes that have been in the news. Sometimes there is warning fatigue. When people hear multiple warnings, people can start tuning out the warnings. About three weeks ago, warnings about Hurricane Henri and that's spelled H-E-N-R-I. That's the big storm that hit the Northeast about three weeks ago. And people were given lots of warning. But at least for New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, that storm was not as bad as predicted. Two weeks later, there's a hurricane called Ida. And it's down and it hits New Orleans. It's way down there. Well, it really accelerated fast. It caught me by surprise when I heard that it was over the Northeast and was caught at causing exceptional flooding and death in the New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania area. Warnings went out to New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania about Hurricane Ida, but they were not heeded with the same seriousness as with Storm Henri. So regarding our physical lives, we would not want to develop warning fatigue. On this day of trumpets, we are reminded that the warning trumpets that God has sounded in his word, in love, has been aimed to the physical people of Israel, and number two, toward his spiritual people. We want to heed, we want to change, we want to prepare, we want to grow, we want to be watching and praying to be counted worthy, to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man at his return. And then we get to serve with Christ in his eternal kingdom forever. <laughs>